So, Berto, have you listened to that new podcast called Dirty John? I did, yes. What do you think of the title of that podcast called it's, Dirty it's, John? It's a provocative title. Yeah. I I had some other podcast I listened to was advertising for it, mm-hmm. and they played a little bit of it. And I, and I just said, I think I've had enough of these kinds of podcasts <laughs> where there's some psychopath that does something horrible. Sure. And the way they're presenting it, it's like, ooh, scary, you know? There's, I feel like there's this huge trend on podcast mm-hmm. in the podcast world right now where everything has to be scary. Sure, yeah. Like in the, in the, in the mid-2000s, when I when we came on the scene in two thousand eight, they were mainly uh, educational. Yeah, for, for, very topic driven. Like yeah. I, I I listened to some that were video game related and stuff like that. Right, and then it seemed like there were like sciency kinds of podcasts. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, like uh, Radio Lab and, right. and this sort of thing. And then all of a sudden, it seemed like overnight, <laughs> every popular podcast now is <laughs> is about is about like is are basically mini documentaries on the scariest human stuff that's ever sure. you know. Whereas I thought when I heard the title, I thought it was about prostitution. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. It didn't even occur to me. So at first, I I was like, yeah, I think I've had enough of this sort of thing. And there's so many other great podcasts out there that I'm I'm behind on listening to. So, but then you reach out to me and you're like, hey, have you heard this Dirty John podcast? Mm-hmm. We should do a we should do an episode on it. And I looked at it, and it's only like seven episodes, six, I think. Yeah. Okay. And it's not very doesn't take very long to listen. No, to. it's not a huge investment. It's probably like what <clears throat> four hours, three hours, or something. Right. And so, and it has an ending. There's, it's yeah. not like an open-ended thing. It's, it's basically one story in about three hours of listening. Right. And when one thing I liked about, uh, we haven't even started. The- this is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Beto? My name is Humberto Castaneda, and I train people on how to use fidget spinners correctly. So, uh, what were you going to say? Well, I was going to say that, like... You know, I, I first, I literally did think it was about prostitution because I thought, you know, a John, dirty John, you know. But, and uh, the only reason I started listening to it is because I was uh, scrolling through Dig uh, and I saw this thing and I was like, oh, dirty John. But I didn't, I didn't like think about it. I thought, oh, it must be about prostitution. And then it came up again and I saw something about like, like the picture of the guy and it said something about like, you know, this, it did make it sound like sort of scary. And I was like, okay. And I started listening. Um, but I actually found that it, what, what was fascinating to me is that I was expecting it to be a, like, and here was his first murder and here was a second murder. Right. But what was so much real and more relatable on everyday life was that, yeah, this was a, a psychopath type person, but, but a sort of a person you could run into. Yeah. So we're going to spoil the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, spoiler alert. Because <laughs> we hate having to edit ourselves. Yes. So, And it does have a, a surprise ending. Mm-hmm. That isn't like if it was spoiled for you. If it was spoiled for me, it wouldn't, it wouldn't completely ruin it for me. No. If, but it is, it, it is a twist at the end. Yeah. But really, the, the big appeal of this podcast is just hearing about the story and so it can't really be spoiled in my view but basically it's about a woman deborah she's a successful interior designer you know she's a a woman who's i think been married like three other times or something and she's wealthy and she's in her 50s or something and she meets a guy named john and he's a hands on on like match.com or something and he's a handsome man who uh, seems to have it all. He's attractive. He's single. He he's a doctor with Doctors Without Borders. He's done all these dashing things, like yeah. jumped out of helicopters in Iraq and everything. And he's an anest- anesthesiologist. How do you say it? anesthesiologist? Anest- anesthetician. Anesthetician. Wait, uh, no. Anesthesiolo- anesthesiologist. 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 Anesthetician is something else. Damn it. <laughs> I don't know why it's so hard. For well, me. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, but he 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 makes people fall asleep so they so you can be cut, cut into <laughs> at surgery. But. Her f- so so you know she meets this guy in match and she starts dating him, 
And her family, her kids, her two daughters in particular, hate this guy. Immediately. Yeah, right away. They're just like, something's wrong with this guy. Which, which by the way, that, that right off the bat was so interesting to me because um, this person, the same person, right, it is able to come off so well to her and so bad to very close people to her. Uh, and presumably she was observing him because it didn't indicate like, you know, it's the one thing if initially he pulled them aside and he's like, ah, I'm actually evil and I want all your guys' money. But that's not the case. It's just they saw his interactions with her and with them and they concluded, okay, there's something wrong with this guy. Right. So the reason why I think it's a worthy episode for our podcast is the whole story is a case study in a a family as it faces a, a new member of the family who has massive psychological issues yeah and how that all plays out and and how to see it i think is interesting and so maybe since you introduced that i think maybe we should go into that a little bit in terms of why do you think that is and yeah. and how do we see it and how do you think the podcast the other thing I should say before I forget is that the pod so the podcast was made by Christopher Gofford for the LA Times. Mm -hmm. Apparently now publications are making podcasts. Like there right. was that one that was made by I think it was like the Des Moines in Inquirer or something or the Ohio and some Midwest that's called the Inquirer, which oh. I find to be a very unfortunate name, <laughs> because this whole, the whole podcast was about they're investigating the murder of this one woman, I think, and it was a pretty interesting episode. And she kept saying, "I'm so and so from the Inquirer," and I'm like, uh -huh. "Really, the Inquirer?" But that's the National Inquirer. I see. Apparently, there's like you know the Springfield Inquirer. Uh, okay, which anyway, makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> but it's interesting that a lot of these uh, right. you know, uh, traditional publications are now sponsoring podcasts You're trying to find new ways to reach which audience. makes total sense because you have a team of reporters you have an editorial staff right you have advertisers you know how to put a story together you have writers yeah. you know and and so that's what this is is this christopher gofford i think that's how you pronounce his name for the la times right has been doing stories like this all the time and then he just then they just decided to record all of his conversations with all these people, which is, is it's, and the way it's all put together and the way he asks questions and the, the kind of journey that they take you on is pretty interesting. And again, it's, right. you know, it doesn't take too long, but anyway, so why, what is our conceptualization of this guy psychologically? Because basically right from the start, so let's just go on this facts. Let's just sort of summarize yeah. the facts. He, he starts dating, well, let's spoil the whole thing and go yeah. back back in time. Well, I mean, when he starts dating her, the facade he's putting for her is almost a hundred percent fabricated. You know, yeah. he's not a surgeon or not an, uh, a, a true doctor. Yeah, he's a nurse. He's, he's a nurse, and he uh, doesn't hasn't flown in these missions and things like that. He is actually homeless. Yeah, he's currently unemployed. He's currently unemployed, and he just got out of prison. He got out of prison. Yeah. Um, he went into prison for what again? Like, was it money fraud or something? Or yeah, yeah, it was because um, uh, that was the other thing. Is he, he comes from a family of basically sort of at least friendly to crime sort of background. Right. So, so let's just briefly summarize his life. Yeah. He he grows up in a family in which his father was a, was actively encouraging his kids to involve themselves in scams and crim, criminal right. activity and intimidation. His dad, um, like, they talk to J Dirty John's sister, I think, and yeah. the sister is saying things like, our parents were awful, awful people, yeah. I think is what she was saying. And, and they were uh, ter terrible parents and taught terrible lessons. And it sounds like... Dirty John's father was kind of a con man himself and mm -hmm. an aggressive person and 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 would say and was like would tell people he was involved with with the mob, with the mob even though it's questionable whether or not that's right. true. And and then Dirty John adapted that. Right. It's like Dirty John's just like his dad or a worse version of his dad Ad or something. Adopted him. <laughs> and yeah. then and then he Dirty John grows up. The reason why they call him Dirty John is because he was so shady in college and in his 20s that his friends started calling him Dirty John because 
they just observed his behavior. He was uh, he was always trying to figure out a scam. He was always working an angle, and he was he was um, exploitative of women. And yeah, I got the sense that a lot of it had to do with his behavior around women. Okay. Uh, and they and they said in that bachelor party interview, yeah, they were, they were like, oh well, you know, I mean, we call him like Filthy John or whatever, yeah, but uh, we can't really talk about why right now, <laughs> right, right. And so he goes to college and he becomes a nurse and he specializes in anesthesiology, and he starts to work. He gets married, and he uh, doesn't invite any of his family to the wedding. He mm-hmm. just totally wants to get get away from his family because his family has issues and right. and also he's already starting to kind of lie about his past, like the weird lies really. Instead right. of saying because his real name's John, his born name is John, but he starts calling himself Jonathan. Right, and and he lies about his age. He says he's younger. He says he's five years younger. Yeah, to his wife, and then. He his in the marriage something goes wrong and the wife wants to divorce him and he, that's when he turns on her. Um, right. Why did she want to divorce him? Well, remember the there was something about like he immediately starts um, having pro- like affairs and like just sleeping around and stuff like that. Okay. And and I I don't know if that was the entirety of it, but um, and and remember they were saying that during the wedding there was a sense of like. Very, these weren't people that he's known all his life or you're like, oh, we grew up together. It was all like people that knew him for like a year in call and you know, like really superficial acquaintances. Right. Um, and in fact, I forget, but it was a comment of like, I can't believe he's getting married. Like, you know, it's right. stuff like that. Yeah. And then she reached <clears throat> out, she found his parents and his his siblings and started talking with them. And mm, yes. They started telling her information and she's like, wait, so he's been lying to me about right. his birthday and his name and what, you know, what else is he lying to me about? And then she divorces him. And and it should be noted that these are very attractive people. Yeah. Dirt, Dirty John is a is an attractive guy. He kind of reminds me of like a like a pudgy Tom Selleck or something. <laughs> um, yeah. And anyway, so she divorces him and he turns on her and becomes very threatening. Right. And oh, and by the way, he's they make a point of saying that in his quote unquote prime, he was very physically imposing because he was like six foot two, um, did heavy steroids and weights and stuff. So he was a big guy. Yeah. So physically imposing. Yeah. And so he starts to threaten her and then she starts to, they have kids together. Right. And she she starts to record these conversations because she's gone to the police, mm-hmm. and they play those some of those tapes on the podcast, and it's pretty interesting. He's like, he's like, you know, when when you get yours, yeah, I'm a, you'll know it was me. And she's like, like, what are you talking about? What yeah. are you threatening me? Yeah, you, are you saying? Because she's trying to get him to say something yeah. on tape, and he's like, well, you'll know. Believe me, yeah. one day when you least expect it. Something's going to happen to you, and it's going to be because I made it happen. And, yeah. You know. And he says, you know, I've been reacquainting myself with part of my family. Yeah. That, and he implies it's the mob. Right. And uh, just something very bad can happen, you know? Right. right. And so, yeah. So then, some, is, is that what lands him in prison? Because he... Is no, the, I, I, did, I th- there was an actual... Uh, he broke the law with some scam or something like I can't remember the details some sort of other scam and he yeah. goes to, he goes to jail um how long did he go to prison for it was it was years <laughs> like he was in jail for several years yeah like like 10 years or something I don't know if it's that long but anyway, it was a while <laughs> so he emerges from prison yeah. and he immediately and his sister is trying to help him right and trying to get him back on his feet it's like okay you need to get a job you need to live an honest life, John. You know, let's yeah. let's put aside that bullshit in the past. Let's live an honest life. Get a job. And she looks over at the computer screen, hoping he's looking for jobs, and he's actually on Match. dot com, right, or something <laughs> like that. And she just looks at him. He's, she's like, "Really? Like the day you get out of prison, <laughs> and we're talking about how to build your life, and this is what you want to do with your time, right?" And she just she said she kind of gave up on him at that point, and that's actually when he meets Deborah, right, the star of this podcast, and proceeds to date her, and they fall in love, and they get secretly married, and yeah, 
And Deborah is in this weird position because all of her family hates him, or many of them do. Yeah, in some cases, he starts threatening them. Right. And uh, well, and it's also interesting because she describes how when she starts trying to date online, she was continuously disappointed. Right. You know, she'd meet with these guys and they didn't look as good as in their picture and they were sort of boring. They didn't get along. And then she goes out with John and in their date initially, she's like, oh, this seems really interesting and everything. But when they go to her house, he and it should tries- be noted. It should be noted. He's always wearing his scrubs. Oh, right. Yeah, he's always, hey, well, oh, are they? Yeah. <laughs> but then when they go to his, to her house or whatever, he tries to get more physical than she wants. Yeah. And it, it, she made it sound like it got intense, like she had to push him off to the point where he had to apologize later. Yeah. I th- Was it push off? It was It was some, I, I got the impression that it was aggressive talk, like, come on, like, Come on, let you know. Come on, let's do it. And I, I, if you if you hear it again, I'm pretty sure she she indicated that he, that like he tried to okay. to. I, no, that's not to say like oh he raped me or anything. It's no. just I think he tried to make moves she was definitely not comfortable with to yeah. the point where he had to apologize. Right to the point where she went to her, like her daughter and said like yeah I thought this guy was yeah. going to be great but he ended up be, and I ended up having to kick him out of the house. So that red flag didn't kick in for her. Well, geez, so we can get into that whole thing. Yeah. So um, so what's the diagnosis, Berto? Like, how do we label him psychologically? Well, so far, because he he seems to lie kind of compulsively about his who he is, what he is doing, who he is, et cetera, because he has been fairly dysfunctional and, you know, had to go to jail and messed up, you know, uh, his marriage, all these things, he seems pretty unempathetic in his interactions in those recordings that you hear and in fact you know threatening and you know violent even and stuff like that like my layman thing would be to say i think he's like a psychopath right so let's go down the symptoms uh long story short he is a quintessential psychopath he's a classic case actually he's why hair even developed the measure interesting as a way of uh, and you'll you'll get the picture as we go through the different right. symptoms. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, this this is exactly what this yeah. diagnosis, what this label was developed for, was a guy like this. Well, in fact, what's funny is before we did our podcasts and before we've talked about this topic, uh-huh. if you had asked me this, I don't know, ten years ago or something, I would have probably said, oh, I don't know, he seems like a crook, but he's not a psychopath, you know. Like with the knife and the killing, right? And, which is funny because it will come. But but that was yeah. interesting because through our conversations about this, I was able to pick up some of those things. I'm like, oh yeah, right, right. So you're learning. That's good. So symptom number one: super is he superficially charming and glib? Oh yes. How so? Well, that is basically what attracted her to him. Is he was able to put on the charm, and then he was described alternatively as either you know really odd or charming you know right so that to me indicates that it's something that he could turn on but wasn't like just part of his normal character right there are people in her family including deborah herself who were you know reported to on this podcast that they thought John, Dirty John was this really nice guy. Yeah. Charming, listened to you, was nice and funny and right. just a great guy. And then alternatively was a terrible person. Yeah. All right. Inflated sense of self-worth. Yeah. I mean, first of all, in the stories he tells, whether he is fully aware of how much he's exaggerating, he could have gone for a more normal narrative and still be lying. But instead it's like these like hero narratives. Right. And then he also, in his conversations, he seems so self-entitled. Yeah. Like he's entitled to all the money. He's entitled to all all the rights of the family. Like he's just entitled, you know? Right. Right. So the phrase self-worth is a little weird to me. The way that you phrased it is evidence of what I would say a inflated sort of presentation of self-worth mm. or something. But whether or not he deep down actually felt that way about himself is, is hard to know. Sure. So that's a, that's a little bit of a question mark for me. There's, there's really only 
three question marks, and that's one of them. Uh, uh, I might, as evidenced in that bucket, then I might also throw in the whole, oh, I come from this family of the the mob, which seems odd, like it's just a bragging thing, but he's so proud of it. Yeah. Like, oh, he's he's connected, and that's his background, and right. it's like, really, you you would be proud of that? Like, right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a constant need for stimulation. Uh, this is actually one of my question marks, but mm. but is there evidence for a constant need for stimulation? Well, there was a thing of like, um, he did, didn't he, like, he liked water stuff, you know, boating, things like that. He also... But when I, when I hear constant need for stimulation, I... Here, I, I think about people who drink a lot, use drugs a lot, mm. who do a lot of extreme sports, maybe, who get bored like really easily. Yeah, yeah. Whereas he didn't present like that. Okay. Deborah would talk about him like he he would he would get up and he'd act like he went to work or he'd just stay home. Yeah, that's, actually, that's a good point. He I played I got, a lot of Call of Duty, you know. Oh, you know, maybe that's Matt, maybe that's the outlet. But, but that's not like a, stimulating. But it's not like a lot of stimulation. You know what I mean? It's like it again. When I think, when I know, when I apply this label to people that I'm yeah. diagnosing the constant need for stimulation, it's usually like uh, excessive activity in things that often result in self destruction. You know, I see lots of sex, lots of masturbation, actually, lots of drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Lots of well, going they did out call at him night. Dirty John, <laughs> but he didn't apparently cheat on her while they were while they were together. Okay. Now, the other thing is, is he's in his fifties at this point, right? Yeah. And p- psychopathy tends to decrease over the years, or at least the manifestation of the bad behaviors, the annoying behaviors. And so, we could say that when he was in college and young, that he probably did have that presentation as a drinker and a sexer and all that kind of stuff. And, and I mean, like, okay, the guys they interviewed at the party, to me, and maybe this is unfair, but they seem like very stereotypical, like, frat guys, right? Yeah. And they were calling him, oh, that's Dirty John. <laughs> yeah. So you can kind of maybe imagine he was a party wreck in right. college, right? Yeah, yeah. What about lying pathologically? That, absolutely. Like, yeah. nonstop. Yeah. Just, which is an interesting <laughs> thing because when I thought about it later, I thought that is that is pathological lying in that he didn't need to lie. No. Why did he name his, why did he call himself Jonathan instead of John? Right. Why did he make his birthday five years earlier? <laughs> yeah. Like, to his wife. It's like, she's going to find out eventually. She's your wife. Yeah, actually, lies that not only are unnecessary, but could destroy your whole point of lying in the first place. Right. It's the same thing with the exaggerations. Um, okay, I could see in this case, if someone's trying to pass off as more legit, it's say like, I do have a job, I'm employed, right? Because if he's unemployed and he's embarrassed about it and stuff. But he's not employed, he's an, a, a doctor and an anesthesia doctor, you know, it's like hardcore. They, they get paid tons of money. They're very well respected. It's a hard profession. And he's been in Doctors Without Borders. Yeah. It's like 10x the lies. Right, <laughs> right. The, you know, being a, a nurse, as, um, anesthesiologist. Anest, 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 say it again. Anesthesiologist. 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 Um, <laughs> is a badass profession, you know? And on the scale of professions. Yeah, of course. That's, you know, uh, on the that's on one side of the bell curve. Let's right. just put it that way. So why not just keep it at that? Yeah, that wasn't good enough. Yeah. Or why not go back to school and become a physician if that's what you want to do? I don't know. Yeah, there's just all these weird little lies that he would do, you know, and... And that's the definition of path, pathological lying. Now, the the typical way of seeing pathological lying in, for laymen and among many clinicians, in my experience, is basically at the core of one's personality is this is something dirty. Is something there's something manipulative and mm-hmm. and evil almost about someone. Someone who wants to. Uh, trick people because they like it or they want to trick people for their own means or something. I see. But the 
the development I mean, I'm going to cut to the chase and say that my thesis about this guy is he's a tragic figure. He was he created tragedy around him. Yeah. But he clearly in my view wanted to live a normal good life. Right. He, he, he when he got out of prison, he meets Deborah and he was at initially for a while anyway this really nice guy. Yeah. Now, when you the the sense you get from the story you know, tellers and the, and particularly the people in the family and whatnot is like he's evil and he's out to manipulate and he's out to get her money or something. Yeah, and that's one way of looking at it. And we'll never be able to answer these questions like what really motivates any particular human. But the part of it that I didn't think was being talked about was he was, in my view, desperate for attachment. He gets out of prison. And he wants a stable relationship, as anyone mm-hmm. does. And so he goes on a match. He, he meets this woman. Maybe he's like, wouldn't it be nice if she actually made a lot of money? Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a good point. Yeah. A- and then he ends up in the relationship with her. And for a while, he's, he's trying to be nice. He's yeah. trying to hold together. These other people are starting to threaten his relationship with her. And he gets upset because he really wants to be with Deborah. He reacts in this really dysfunctional way right. because that's what he was taught and because he has a psychological condition that makes it so that he can't really think straight in situations like that. Right. You know, he jumps to intimidation too quickly. He's threatened too easily. He has too much uh, – he doesn't have enough empathy. You know? right, it's right. like he needs to think about like, well – you know, if if I was there with him in those moments, and he's like, so I'm getting the vibe that, you know, and he came to me for therapy. I'm getting the vibe that these people are against me, and so I'm I'm gonna really let him have it. And so I would talk with him about, well, what do you want out of this situation? Well, I want to be with Deborah. Well, how do you think this is gonna play out if yeah, right. if you end up alienating her? You know, there's a, I, I get that you're worried that you're gonna lose Deborah. But there's a there's a better way, and I've talked with people in 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 this it's similar, not not exactly like this guy, but but other people in similar situations. You know, there's a lot of notions in our society, particularly around masculinity, that you need to assert yourself, you know, and you need to you need to grab the woman, and right. you need to make it happen, and and you need to put down your enemies, and you know, sh- you know, just look at Jerry Springer, everyone's screaming at each other. You know, there's, <laughs> there's clear messages in our society that say. If someone gets in your way, you know, you got to put that down. Right, right. You got to intimidate that person. And so uh, I think that his pathological lying was his desperation for attachment, his desperation for for closeness and stability. Because there's so many other ways one can scam money, right. you know, uh, <laughs> other than other than just uh, dealing with a woman and all of her family members. Yeah, well, he could have made it a much quicker scam in that case. Right. He could have, like, defrauded her by taking all her bank account money or right. something like that. And that's what they were kind of implying was, like, she, he would go from woman to woman yeah. and take their money. And he did sometimes do that. Yeah. And that I don't have any sympathy for this man. I don't, and, of course not. And I don't have any sympathy for what he did. But I think that the part of the sh- the the... The line of thinking that I think wasn't really presented in this podcast, which is really typical, is the kind of the the vibe I'm talking about. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. What yeah, is, that, that makes sense. I, I think I think you're right in that, um, at least from what's been presented, because you know we don't know did he the extent of the other people he actually hurt in his life and stuff like that. But from what's been presented, uh, it did seem like at like Deborah wasn't being. Um, physically abused right like there, there was no indication that he was like hitting her or things like that yeah. and she seemed to want to be in the relationship yeah um and so maybe it was him not being able to deal with what you you're calling what he perceived as threats right and that spiraled out of control for him right exactly yeah and he was taught a certain thing as a child and he probably had a biological disposition for psychopathy anyway yeah. for lack of empathy and a lack of fear um, there's there's associations with like a lack of fear with psychopathy, which is interesting mm. because when you're when you're a young child and you're developing and your parents look at you with a face of like anger or a face of disapproval, right? 
that activates a young child's fear response. Mm -hmm. Like, oh my God, my parents are upset at me. Well, imagine if you don't have that fear response in the way that other people do. And because the primary way to to modify a child's behavior is to, sorry, my alarm's going up. Uh, that, that's us telling us that we have to take a break, but let me finish this point. Um, <laughs> is that, um, you know, when you, when you look, the primary way of modifying a child's behavior is to look at them and, and be like, no, no, stop it, you know, or like, you know, you get an angry face and you say no. And, you know, and, um, and imagine if as a three-year-old, you're just, you're just unaffected by that. You're just right. like, huh, they're putting on that face. That face, yeah. They're, yeah, that, isn't that funny that they're trying to scare me? I, <laughs> I'm not scared. Right. You know, I, I have no fit. Because you see two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, when you do that to them and they're not ready for it, they freak out. Yeah. You know, they jump. They're like, right. oh my God, you know, like mom's upset at me and what, wait, what am I doing? You know, you see them have a physiological autonomic <laughs> response to that. Right. And, and that's an important element in modifying a child's behavior and, and, and helping them to understand empathy. Cause mm. you know, two-year-olds have very little empathy in right. the way that we hope adults will have. You know, mine, me, give me. This is my, I, you know, uh, a friend comes uh, for a play date and has a stuffed animal. And, you know, little Jenny is just like, that is now mine. That's my stuffed animal. That's mine now. <laughs> I, I see that. I see that stuffed animal. I want it. That's mine. That's psychopathic <laughs> behavior. Right. And and you're like, you know, hey, have empathy for, for your play date. It's like, no, <laughs> this is mine. And, you, and hey, we're going to have to give this back to, you know, to to Jane and and Jenny's just like no my you know right. like you know every kid goes through that kind of stuff and the way you modify psychopathic child behavior is to essentially one of the ways is to essentially make them afraid you're not you're not abusing them but but you're like you're 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 saying sternly no this is not okay and the child's like oh my god mom and dad or right or what my parent is upset at me there you know and and so the, and no one likes to be afraid right no right and so you're like okay well to avoid being made afraid in the future i am now going to not take jane's <laughs> stuffed animal because when i did that i some the series of things happened that made me feel terrible right so i'm going to avoid that well imagine if you don't have that brain mechanism. you don't have an incentive to avoid that yeah behavior. you're just like huh you're you're more calm as a three-year-old thinking right. through this you're just like okay well i want that stuffed animal and my parents are saying these things to me and i don't really care there's no downside yeah <laughs> and and jane is upset because that's the other thing is now jane's upset and if you don't have that that fear response to someone else being upset uh, them, you know, them retaliating against you. are just like, you know, I'm not afraid of that. Yeah, maybe they'll try to smack me around. I don't, I don't really care. Mm. Then, then you just don't develop. That's this is one hypothesis as to why there are psychopaths. Interesting. It's not that they don't have empathy. It's that they don't have fear. And it's a weird hypothesis of the development of of empathy. Right? Is that we develop empathy partially because we we're trying <laughs> to so avoid fair. the fear of what it feels like when we actually harm other people and, yeah. and their response to us and the fact that they might actually get revenge on us, you know? Interesting. If I take Jane's thing and I worry that she's going to punch me in the face or I worry that she's going to take one of my things or I worry that she's going to tell my mom and then my mom is going to chastise me or spank me or take away something and that, you know, it's all kind of a fear system. Yeah. And, and so anyway, um, so as he is, is um, lying, he, so you develop this sense of lying because when you lie, you just don't, you don't, um, you're not worried about the consequences of lying. Yeah. And so you just develop this habit of just like, well, you know, when in doubt, I'll, I'll inflate this and I'll inflate that. And it, I'm not, ev even if I get caught, I don't really worry about it. That's what's so strange about psychopaths is like, like, and that, that's why I love this podcast so much because if you really look at Dirty John, his life is a mess. Mm -hmm. He's not like this calculated mastermind, which, <laughs> which is how often they're presented. And, and if you don't 
really listen carefully, I feel like this podcast presents him as a mastermind. You know, he's like a con man. He's always like figuring out how to manipulate people and blah, blah, blah. And it's, and it's like, I mean, did you get that sense? Well, I got more of the sense that he, he's always trying to forcefully manipulate, but I didn't get the sense that he was often as successful. Good, you know? because he was not successful. Yeah. This man, when he meets Deborah, is coming out of prison. He's homeless. Right. He doesn't have a job and he doesn't even have any <clears throat> clothes. Yeah. And, it's, it's you know because psychopaths are often presented in the media. They're rich. They live in a castle. Yeah, yeah. And because they're very they're, smart. Yeah, they're always like really good at manipulating. They're playing people. six chess games at the same time. Right. <laughs> Whereas you look at this guy's life and stupid choice after stupid choice. Yeah. You know, like what do you want out of life, John? Do you want to? end up in prison again? Do you want to end up dead as what yeah. happened in the case? Or would you rather just have a fun, good life? Well, here's the normal path to a fun, good life. You know, get a job, right. be a normal human being, uh, don't threaten people, don't lie, don't don't yeah. give people a reason to look into your past. Because that's the whole thing. Like, he kept pushing people and kept pushing people. And eventually, they're just like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna look <laughs> yeah. into this guy's pack. I'm gonna get a lawyer." <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with this guy? Yeah, and, and like when he's remember when he's on that phone call with, is it the the son in law of her like uh, Deborah's son in law, I think, or something like that? Uh, Deb. Well, a major character is Deborah's nephew. Oh, nephew, nephew. Yeah, and he, you know, they're having this heated conversation, and the nephew keeps trying to draw these lines in the sand, like, I'm not going to let you do that to our family or something. And John, like, doesn't care. He's like, why don't you come here? Come, come here. Tell me. Just come here, you know? Right. And, and, and you know, clearly, John won't back down. He's like, I don't care. I'm going to take it to the, to the limit. He pushes and pushes and pushes. Right. <laughs> and it's like, to what end, Dirty John? Like, what is your goal here, yeah. right? It, it, if your goal is to have a good life and to, you know, that's the thing about psychopathology is that such as personality disorders is that it's, it's not a, it's not a well thought out approach yeah. to life. Right. And it, and it ends up, you end up shooting yourself in the foot, which is why this podcast, you know, Dirty John is, is a good presentation of that and really lays that out well. And I, and I, I really hope that listeners, when they listen to this, they go, Oh, I get it. Psychopaths, are tragic individuals who create a wake of tragedy around them, but but the most tragic uh, figure is often the individual doing these things. Like, yeah. I don't get the sense this guy was a happy individual. Do you know what I mean? He might have had pockets of happiness, but overall, no. <laughs> I doubt it. I I got the sense like this guy was on in a daily basis feeling like crap mm. because. That's often the case. You're just in a constant state of worry about losing your attachments. Mm. You're in a constant state of of the traumas he went through when he was a kid that he didn't process. In a constant state of remembering like all the disappointment that he's been through in life and yeah. trying to deny that and everything. Anyway, let's take a break. What do you say? Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. If you haven't become a patron of the podcast, do so now by going to patreon.com. Once you become a patron, you get access to a lot of our patron-only episodes. Okay, let's continue with the psychopathic symptoms. So we got superficial charm, inflated sense of self-worth, constant need for stimulation, lying pathologically. What about conning others and being manipulative? Oh, right. Yeah, I mean, um, he was emotionally manipulative in what I heard in, uh, in the podcast, and he was definitely always trying to... Um, Sort of get the the edge, but using co like uh, threats. Yeah, a lot of them violent threats. But he also, I think, in line with this symptom, is the lying about Doctors Without Borders. Oh, and, sure, yeah. You know, it's a very cunning. Yeah. You're trying to you're trying to manipulate. He's trying to manipulate Deborah and other right. women to respect him more and stuff. Oh, and like the scrubs thing. Yeah. Like what was it that he didn't have any other clothes? I didn't See, think so. That's the thing. Like. <laughs> the scrubs alone. So yeah. <laughs> people didn't listen to them. He would wear this these dirty scrubs all the time. And other people <laughs> in the family who know physicians know that you don't wear your scrubs <laughs> to like a uh, like a Thanksgiving dinner. No. <laughs> and and so And if your scrubs are dirty from the street, you can't use them in the hospital. <laughs> right. So 
so you know the the fact that he's that that's what this is psycho the ninety nine point nine percent of psychopaths are like this they they're stupid they they don't they're trying so hard it becomes obvious mm. and that's why his that so Deborah is in love with Dirty John she's yeah. just like oh he's dashing I want love and so as anyone you'll get clouded to yeah. to reality. But the family members, you know, her her kids and other people, they're not in love with him. So they're looking at him, you know, with with without rose colored glasses, right? Yeah. And so, and it's immediately apparent upon meeting him that something's up with this guy. Yeah. And that's the thing about psychopathy is like, the these are not geniuses. They're not good at manipulating other people. They're quite obvious. Like when you interact with them, you'll pretty quickly realize ah uh, something's up with this guy yeah you'll you'll feel it like the daughter meets him and she's immediately like he's a slob he's just like moping around the house yeah you know and she she's immediately turned off by him yeah i was interpreting all of that initial reactivity from the two daughters as them picking up on something when you interact with someone who doesn't have empathy you feel it in your bones. Mm. I do. When I interact with someone who has a personality disorder that has an element of a lack of empathy, I feel it in my bones right away. Interesting. There's something unnerving about someone without empathy. Even if you don't have evidence that they don't have empathy. There's something about facial expressions. It's it's weird. Like they'll, you know, they might be saying things like, "Oh, that's interesting, but you you get a sense like they're not sincere. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and so you in your bones, in your all of your uh, brain power that's spent on picking up on facial cues mm-hmm. and and you know nonverbal cues. Yeah, is alarm bells are going off like something's incongruent here. I'm not. I don't know what you know. Your brain doesn't know psychopath, but your brain is like something's kind of off right. in this situation. You know, like all the usual back and forth I get to do with people, it's not right. Yeah, there's something different here. And we're, I think, programmed or evolved to when we pick up on incongruencies and something's off, we tend to get a little afraid because we like things to feel familiar. And so sure. when something doesn't feel familiar we get a little afraid. And so I think I, that was my, you know, it's reading into it quite a bit, but that was my guess as to what was happening. So the next uh, symptom here, lack of remorse or guilt. Did he exhibit that? Lack of remorse. Well, I don't think he ever felt anything was his fault. No. no Nothing. He, no. He did, he did empirically horrible things that we heard about. Yeah, no, no evidence of, of remorse or guilt. He was always a victim. Yeah, I mean... You know, the things that he would do and say, it's like, how about just say you're sorry, you know, or <laughs> how about just sort of say, hmm, he, 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 he just relentlessly was aggressive verbally with people yeah. just at the drop of a hat, even again, as it started to escalate <laughs> with Deborah's family, he just, he just, he just kept at it, you know? Yeah. So what about shallow emotions? Well, that one, it's a little hard because yeah. I'm assuming, yes, uh, um, I, I am still in, intrigued. What was the deal with that? Because Deborah had lost her sister, right? Right. So Deborah's this sister was murdered, murdered by, yeah. by the sister's husband. And then there was also something else, which is maybe not a thing, but um, Deborah's, uh, um, remind me, who was... The, the person in the end who he fights with. That's is Deborah's, Deborah's daughter, daughter. Tara. Okay. There's something in her voice yeah. that I found interesting. She she had that sort of voice, like she went through some, maybe some tough times young. It could be Well, you're nothing. doing the Dr. Drew thing. Yeah, it could be nothing, but, yeah. but there was something in her voice. So I sort of had this sense, like maybe we don't know the whole story about Deborah's uh, past in the sense of why she might find it irresistible to be attracted to someone like John. Yeah. And and that that we don't necessarily have all the pieces. But there must be something there because because just because you like someone 
he he wasn't in her life for 10 years you know it was it was a fairly quick it's strong intense attachment that developed for someone who was not a a, a teenager she was 50 you know well, in her 50s age has nothing to do with that well I, I guess but age does give you experience you know like no not in my <laughs> you, you would like to think and that's the cultural notion that somehow adults are better able to manage love relationships. And I'm here to tell you that is just not my experience. No, well, maybe not. I mean, but, certainly 15 year olds might have a little bit more of a deficit, but, um, but the, the propensity to fall in love quickly and be, um, I guess what I was trying blind. to say was if she was on the level, then he must have had enough actual emotions that she could work with. Otherwise, why would she have been so attached to him? Well, so, good question. Yeah, this is the other question mark for me is the emotion part. It, and, you're, and you're good to sort of wonder maybe when it was just the two of them and there wasn't any threats that were happening on the outside that there was a depth of emotion that Deborah was picking up on that she appreciated, right? Yeah, um, yeah totally. I didn't see... There's no evidence to me in terms of what they presented that he had shallow emotions. Um, so, but he might have, yeah. it's hard to know. I, I guess I, part of what I was saying with age is when, when I started dating or I imagine when someone starts dating in general, you sort of don't know what's right and what's wrong. Like what you even are supposed to expect out of dating someone, you know, cause you see in movies like, okay, the, the thing is dating, but but in reality, like, what's it supposed to feel like? What am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? Yeah. So I imagine when you're young and you start dating someone, let's say you're a girl and you start dating a guy, if the guy sort of like doesn't say too many things, he doesn't like he doesn't cry in movies, whatever, like any number of things. How, how are you supposed to know if that's normal or not normal? The only thing you could base it on is, well, are my brothers like that? Is my dad like that? Is uh, my uncle like that? You know, stuff like that. Yeah. But if you've dated throughout your life, maybe you at least have some frames of reference of like, yeah. you know, this guy never compliments me or something, you know, things like that. Yeah. I'll give you that. Yeah. What about callousness and lack of empathy? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I think certainly, yeah. at least in his words and final actions. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we also don't know if he did worse things that we, you know, yeah. neither us nor, nor the police know about. What about using others and being a parasite? Uh, definitely he was perceived as a parasite by the entire family except Deborah. Yeah, he, yeah. He, he, he's, he's a classic psychopathic parasite yeah. in that he, he found a woman who had money and just proceeded to be a parasite of yeah. her. Uh, so, so there's that. What about poor control over behavior? Yeah, I mean... Uh, like you're saying, I didn't get the sense that when he was blowing up on the phone and saying all these threats, like it was this part of a master plan. It yeah. was him losing control. Right, right. Yeah. Promiscuous sexual behavior. Well, so uh, two things. There was the indication in college, that, I mean, they made very, very um, uh, poignant comments about how he was around women and what he did with women without going into graphic detail because they, they, they're like, we don't want to talk about it. The second thing was uh, when he was no longer with Deborah. Uh, there was that thing about how he had been seeing women like nonstop. Do you remember this? Like, uh -uh. I th was it his sister? I think it was his sister that was saying that that he was seeing s women, or maybe this was before he started seeing Deborah. Yeah. I can't quite remember. The sister was saying something about it that she realized that John was just like going through women and dating yeah, them. Plenty of fish. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So definitely promiscuous sexual behavior when he was younger and maybe during his adult, yeah. uh, older adult life too. Behavioral problems early in life. No well, uh, I don't remember if they talked about him getting in trouble in, in school and stuff like that, but it sounds like he was always um, yeah. a troublemaker. <laughs> right. This is basically a, a symptom to demonstrate that it's been a lifelong behavioral pattern yeah. related to his personality. Have you seen the movie It, the new one? No, is it good? I liked it, yeah. Uh, maybe if you watch it, we should talk about it. I'm not into horror. Do you think it would be good one? I don't know. If you're if you're not into horror, maybe it's not. But it's not a cheesy horror movie. It's I heard more it's like actually, Stranger Things. Yeah, I heard it's kind of like Stranger Things. It's like Stranger Things. Uh, someone described it as Goonies meets... Uh, what, oh, what was the other movie they compared it to? 
well oh uh stand by me or something you know like oh, okay. but 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 it is horror i mean it's you know right. scary things uh lack of realistic long-term goals any yeah uh, yeah <laughs> certainly yeah his entire <laughs> life is one lack of realistic <laughs> yeah. long-term goal what about being impulsive um well he was he was impulsive in his reactions towards people totally for sure yeah, yeah he was very impulsive uh being irresponsible yeah, I mean... Yeah, he's extremely no. <laughs> irresponsible. Blaming others and refusing to oh. accept responsibility. Uh, yes, and even... Because and, I was going to say about the irresponsibility, but I think it also applies in this one. Remember the story about how he started... Like, he wasn't even doing a good job as a nurse... Right. Anesthes anesthesiologist. Yeah. And they were... And it was causing patients to, like... Yeah. Come out early and, like, all sorts of problems. Right. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, he was he was taking drugs from work and blah, blah, blah. Right. Blaming others. And, yeah. Uh, having several marital relationships. Yes. Yes. Delinquency when young. Yes. Yes. Criminal acts in several realms. In several realms. Well, we know for a fact he tried to kill someone. <laughs> yeah. We know also... Well, that's debatable. <laughs> oh, what? Yeah. But How? anyway, well, at the very least, he he was assaultive, extreme, in the extreme. Wait, wait, why do you think it's debatable? Well, let, let's let's continue oh, with okay, this. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, yeah, he was like a money fraud. He was he would steal stuff from uh, his work in terms of drugs. Uh, there there were several realms of of criminality. Yes. The idea is is that you have a general personality problem that leads to that just leads to general criminality. Yeah, it you know. Someone who doesn't have a personality problem like psychopathy will be will tend to be a criminal in one area, you know, yeah. like I steal makeup or I rob banks or something. Right. But but when I'm not robbing banks, it's not like I'm just impulsively cr a criminal, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's go to the very end. The twist at the end is he is uh, trying to intimidate Tara, the daughter, right, to back off oh is that why you're saying it you're saying that he might have just been trying to scare her yeah i mean if you wanted oh, to if I you see. wanted to just take her out um and this is i think what they speculated what the the la times guy was speculating was like he he went to tara to try to intimidate her to be with a knife but didn't plan on actually using it on her but they, I don't remember the exact. Remember you know. that in, in his trunk, they found a rope, duct tape, oh, some right. other stuff. Now, again, to, to your point, though, he may be having tons of fantasies, yeah. but not fully intending to go through with right. it. Right. Which, which is still of, bad enough. Right? Yeah, well, <laughs> fantasies. Yeah. But uh, my, and they said like he was kind of weak and whatnot. He had lost. So they said that at his peak, he was like 225 pounds. Or 230 pounds. He was pounds. like 120 pounds. And he was, a, yeah, I was down to 130, 120. Yeah. It's like crazy. Yeah. Like, because he had to, yeah. So, what happens is Dirty John has this uh, massive stomach problem. He's in the hospital for like a month. And Deborah decides, now this is, this is when I'm going to leave. And so, yeah. She gets all of his stuff, puts it in the garage, and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And then that's when Dirty John kind of escalates from there. Yeah. And, and Tara, the this like five foot zero. No, she's five four, right? Oh well, she's really small as a thing. Yeah, but she's not. She's not big. He's six two. <laughs> yeah, and and she, and she he's waiting for her like outside of her car or something. Right. And he uh, tries to intimidate her. They get into a scuffle, and he starts to stab her. He he stabs at her. Yeah. Yeah, and stabs her like several times. Although, yeah, yes, right. And then her arm is particularly badly stabbed yeah and then the knife gets out of his hands which is actually really common in knife fights like this because blood makes things really slippery uh. and, and and then she grabbed the knife and proceeded to like stab him a bunch of times and then stabs him through the eye through the eye and kills him and although he doesn't no, he doesn't die right away remember he goes into a coma well, no, he was brain dead. When they, oh, okay, fine, fine, they, but but he still had a pulse, right? So they were the paramedics arrived. They were they like get his heart going, right, yeah, but yeah. his brain was dead, right? And right. so they pulled okay. him off the, off the you know life support a few days later. Uh, so essentially, you know, she turned off his brain. She anyway. basically yeah, <laughs> um, and so it is just totally. I did not see that coming. I'm like, I'm like. 
I thought what was going to happen was he was going to end up in jail because as I'm listening to the podcast, I'm like, well, we haven't heard from him yeah. and they haven't said what happens to him. And Deborah's kind of talking like he's out of the picture now. Right. So <laughs> where is he, you know, or did yeah. he kill himself or something? And so, so yeah, it's, it's kind of, so there's two scenarios here. One is, is that he showed up, he wanted to get revenge on Tara and he flubbed it and she ended up killing him. Yeah. Which, which, by the way, the the whole podcast opens with, uh, and there's ten knife wounds, and there's stab in the neck, or whatever, you know, like oh, I don't remember police. that. I don't. Yeah, remember the, that. the podcast opens with this police description of all these stab wounds. So immediately, I was expecting, okay, we're gonna hear about all the victims that this guy killed, yeah. and all these things. So it was actually quite but interesting. Yeah. That he no he did he might have, but we never hear about any deaths until he dies. <laughs> right. And that's that's another thing. I, I assume he hasn't killed anybody, right? And I assume that yeah, he had fantasies because he had all that stuff in the trunk, or he had the stuff in the trunk because he wanted to intimidate people. Yeah, he might have actually wanted to kidnap her, right? And yeah, I mean, again, the guy is terrible. Yeah, horrible. No, <laughs> but and I, uh, yeah, right. But but again, if you want to kill someone, if you just want to murder someone, get a gun. It's obviously easy in our country to get a gun, right? And just walk up behind him and kill him. Like, why would you show up with? And it wasn't even like a huge knife. It was like, right, yeah, you know. And and so so there's all that kind of stuff. And uh, so there's so there's one scenario where he showed up. He wanted to kill her. He wanted to bound her. You know, bind her and mm-hmm. dump her. Or he wanted to kidnap her and intimidate her and and then set her free. And you know, and then she, you know she would be intimidated and not talk about not talk shit about him anymore or something, or he would just feel better getting revenge. Um, and, and it's hard to know, but the most, the, but uh, the most comical uh, thing about it is Tara and her husband are really into walking dead. Yeah. Right. So early in the podcast, (laughs) they go on this long jag about how Tara, so Deborah's daughter, you know, the daughter who hated, hated John from the beginning. They go on this long jag about how Tara met her boyfriend and how they started dating. And I'm like, why are we going down this road? And they start talking about how they bonded over the walking dead. And there's these lines of Tara talking about, yeah, I just kind of like walking dead because, you know, it kind of teaches you like survival skills. (laughs) And, you know, it's just kind of interesting to think about like, what if the zombie apocalypse did happen right. and you had to defend yourself? You know, just it's just good life. She's treating it like it's a like it's a life skills kind of <laughs> survivor man. Yeah. <laughs> and and then she talks about after killing, you know, def- through self defense killing Dirty John, she's she attributes <laughs> her success in that altercation to watching The Walking Dead. You gotta and- get him in the head. Yeah. You got to get him in the head. She says something like that. Yeah. Like you got to get- That's how you get the zombie. You can't kill him in the body. You got to get him in the head. And she that's what she did. She <laughs> stabbed him through the eye. Right. And Which is a common thing to do in The Walking Dead. Right. Because it's a lot easier to drive a knife through an eyeball than it is through a skull. Is it? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean- Is it? I mean, an eyeball is fluffy and But I mean, squishy. you have you have skull yeah, behind- but you, you don't have to, you know- <laughs> Plus, there's a little gap at the back. You know, there's a little gap. <laughs> um, you don't have to worry yourself with all the details. <laughs> that was, yeah, that I just thought, I, you know, the way they presented it or the way I took it. I mean, did you take it as kind of comical? Yeah, I, although, I, I mean, I guess in the in the moment, I wasn't laughing just because it was, I was still sort of like, a pick, I was actually putting myself in the situation of seeing this happening and like, just like, oh my gosh, how do you stop something like that? You know, in the middle of it. Yeah. You, you know, I was imagining there's this scuffle. And even if you know clearly who's the aggressor, there's a knife and, and like the mess of that situation, you know? And so that gal that came out and she was like trying to help out and stuff like that, like that would be so messy, you know, so scary and messy. Yeah. Uh, so I, I but I, I see what you're saying. It's still like, like I played Call of Duty and now I know how to, you know, how to fight. <laughs> yeah. All right. The uh, final word about this is that it's a great podcast. It's short. If you're interested in this kind of thing, maybe you're not. It's not scary like other scary podcasts are. It's more of a case study of an abusive person who 
it also it uh, it also kind of teach you about domestic violence actually at interpersonal uh, yeah. uh, intimate partner violence in that he slowly isolated Deborah from the family he would lie he would do bad things Deborah would threaten to leave and then he would beg her to come back he was extremely nice to her uh, un- uncertain times um and would kind of make her depend on him in certain ways right and um, and was very traditional in some ways, and so the so it's a good case it's a good case study in domestic violence as well, and and the, one of the most shocking parts that you sort of alluded to earlier was that at some point Deborah totally leaves him, yeah. you know, for good. You're just like you as you're hearing this story, you're like Deborah, leave this guy, right. leave this guy, and it and it just gets worse and worse and worse, and then finally she leaves him. <laughs> And then, and then she lets him back into <laughs> his, her life, yeah. and then they secretly get married. It's crazy. Yeah, and the whole time you're just like, Deborah, why? There's yeah. so many other fish in the sea. Why this guy? And the part that I didn't think they portrayed well enough was the 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 romance that is involved in these kinds of things. She talked about how she's like, well, you know, I was in love with him. Yeah. And she I, doesn't say like, I finally so glad because I didn't see how much he was hitting me and abusing me and stuff. She, she talks to about him in those, in those ways of like, I really was in love with him. Right. And we all will, we all have to forgive our spouses for their faults. That's a requirement in order to be in a long-term relationship, you have to right. you have to forgive, even without them apologizing. Right, right. You have to tolerate your spouse's uh, shortcomings. That's just part of the it goes gig. with the territory. And so it's hard for people to know what's too much faults, you right. know. And I also love this person. I need this person. I depend on this person emotionally. It feels good when things are good. And what if I never meet anybody else? You know, these are yeah. these are questions I think I hope everyone can relate to. And they make it really hard in that in that situation. And right. and it in the way it's often presented is like, well, you know, she, he tricked her and he manipulated her. And certainly you could say that, but you could also just say like, look, you know, love is blind. It's hard, it's hard to, it's hard to quantify the good feelings that she was getting, getting, uh, getting, yeah. (laughs) Why did I say it like that? The good feelings she was getting. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, uh, it occurs to me, I've never understood when someone uh, gets together with, with someone else and they sort of turn off the rest of their relationships. Yeah. That's always been very puzzling to me. Uh, I can understand to a certain extent, like, well, if you're going to try to build a relationship together, you maybe have to not spend as much time with everyone else. That that makes sense. But I've seen it a few times in my life where someone uh, starts dating a person and they sort of like, because of that relationship, cut ties left and right in, in, in seemingly unnecessary ways. Uh, and I've always been like, wait, if that person is making you change your social circle so dramatically, how, well, first of all, how, and, and second, why, right? Like, why do you yeah. do that? Well, there's a number of reasons for that, obviously. One is, right, that the new spouse is threatened by the friends and will create enough problems for the person that the person's like, ah, it's just easier if I just avoid my friends. Right. Another is that for, you know, your friend, they might have, there, there's a certain attachment style that lends itself to uh, becoming, um, when you when you start a relationship, so you have a bunch of friends, but you have a basically an insecure attachment style. Yeah. You find someone to attach to, and you put all your eggs in that basket because mm. you're so desperate for that closeness. I see. And 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 you you yourself don't even want to hang out with your friends because you don't want anything to interfere with that with uh, that little bit of security you have with that person. It's fascinating. So I feel like that's why I was saying earlier that 
there must have been something on her end oh, yeah. that made it so she was so attracted to this well, kind of situation. Right. So there's two things. One is is that, yes, because she, she very much comes across and even, I think, says that she feels like she's kind of a naive, trusting mm-hmm. person. So there's that. But uh, another part of this is that um, it's very possible that she suffered from attachment issues herself yeah. and... When this guy came along, who was extremely giving, you know, he w- he was very nice to her. Yeah, would take do her dry cleaning, would make dinner for her, right. complimented her all the time. Ta- told her, "I want to marry you." You know, right away, he's like, "I want to be with you forever." And like, there's a there's a very seductive quality to these kinds of people, and so this is why I'm throwing in a little borderline in here. Mm. I, th- I think he had a little of that. Um, and maybe all psychopaths have a little bit of borderline in them. I don't know. But he's he certainly had that need for closeness and that attachment That's and security that I think he was uh, manifesting. The the other the other side to this whole thing, you know, aside from looking for issues that she was suffering, is any you can take the healthiest human being on the planet, the someone who is the most securely attached, has the most you know, psychological resources, has the most social resources, is privileged, blah, 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 blah. And you you have them fall in love with someone who has these, even like 5% of these qualities that Dirty John has. And that person will have a hard time extracting themselves mm-hmm. once the relationship turns abusive. Abusive relationships, if you've never been in one or you've never been close to one, you probably don't really understand it. Because it's a very particular experience to go through. It's and it's it's very it's very scary. The, the fact that you feel perpetually scared of, you know, with Deborah, after a while, as she started to learn more about Dirty John and his lying, imagine what would go through your head mm. in terms of like, what is this guy capable of? Yeah, right. If I break up with him. You know, I could imagine him doing all sorts of terrible things. Right. And so, why risk that? One. Mm-hmm. Two, if I just do some mental gymnastics, I can, you know. This I, isn't so bad. It's not so bad. And, and it's it's all based on fear, though. And so, yeah. there's, a, there's a chance that Deborah was experiencing that, or at least partially. Interesting. And, you know, because that's what people say. It's like, why don't you just leave him? You know, why don't you just leave the asshole? And it's like, unless you have the sort of gumption to actually kill the guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to be walking around able to do things. And if you've ever been in that position where you're afraid that someone's going to take you out, you know that the world is a very unsafe place. Wow. Like, you know, your house is only so secure and you've got to leave at some point. <laughs> yeah. You know, if someone wants to kill you or kill someone you love and get away with it, it's actually not that hard. Right. You know, um, you, can, you just can't, you can't like draw up an actual barrier around yourself and everyone you can. Yeah. About. You can't have a bulletproof barrier all the time. Right. And, and plus, you just sort of think like, well, even if I did have all these measures, do I really want to lay awake at night worrying <laughs> something's going to happen? Yeah. And and so it, it's so scary and so pervasive that you just say, well, it's not that bad, you yeah. know. I, and there's good times, and as long as I don't push those buttons, don't rock the boat. He's you know he's he's okay. And so now that's a slippery slope, and you just it just gets you know yeah. the guy gets worse and worse, and you it's just a tiny little step down the road, and before you know it, you're in this like super super dysfunctional, horrible, abusive relationship, Jeez. and you have a lot of mental you know defenses yeah. to to uh, essentially protect. It's a weird way of protecting the self, you know. And it's also a little bit of the gambler's dilemma, where you you'll feel like. I've invested so much in this. Yeah. I can't I can't walk away now. Right. Like So interesting podcast. Uh thanks for joining us out there. Please take care of yourself because you deserve it.